In the dark days of 1940, Nazi tyranny had stamped its jackboot across Western Europe. Britain had been pushed back into the sea at Dunkirk. Her defences were at a terrible low. All the talk and the fear was of a German invasion. The outlook was bleak for Johnny Englishman. Hitler was very close then, about 21 miles from this exact spot and a lot of these other exact spots as well. He wanted Britain out of the war. If he couldn't convince Churchill that was a brilliant idea, he'd bomb us until we changed our minds. And failing that, he'd invade. Where's he gone? After the Germans pushed the British off the continent at Dunkirk in May 1940, there were persistent stories that Hitler invaded England. He's said to have invaded here, at the evacuated village of Shingle Street in Suffolk, on the night of 31st August 1940. The story is that the Nazis got their fingers burnt and that it was all hushed up. It was a major invasion and as the land and craft came in, the sea was set on fire we saw the glow, which lasted for about an hour, and then we heard the gunfire and explosions, which went on until about six o'clock in the morning. What happened at Shingle Street? To be perfectly honest, nobody really knows. It could have been, as some people suppose, a full-blown uh, German invasion attempt that went wrong. There are rumours uh, that the Nazis invaded Britain. Uh, they did not. There were many Germans who were uh, very, very bad uh, burned. Did it really happen? Was the English Channel awash with the bodies of badly burned Germans? Or was it all a conspiracy conjured up by Britain's propaganda wizards? After Dunkirk, it became obvious that the only way of attacking the Germans uh, was not militarily, it was with propaganda. The Germans kept us guessing and we kept them guessing. Black propaganda pretends to be something that it isn't. And white propaganda was the truth, but perhaps an economically designed truth. Hitler did invade and occupy the British Isles. In July 1940, he took over the Channel Islands. What was to stop him from making the next step and taking over the rest of the country? The answer was almost nothing. After the British retreat from Dunkirk, it looked like Britain might be invaded. With half of its kit abandoned in France, the army needed help. So it was here, at BBC Broadcasting House, on the 14th of May 1940, that Anthony Eden, Secretary of State for War for just three days, spoke to the nation. In a proud and plummy voice, he announced he was setting up the Home Guard. We want large numbers of men to come forward now and offer their service, the name of the new force will be the Local Defence Volunteers. Your loyal help will make and keep our country safe. The nation rallied to Eden's call. By the end of the next day, 250,000 men had volunteered. By the end of the month, 750,000. Initially, they had no uniforms, and perhaps more worrying, no guns either. Could you please oblige us with the Bren gun, or failing that a hand grenade will do? The shortage of guns and uniforms was not improved by the ever increasing number of volunteers. By July 1940, when Winston Churchill changed its name from the local defence volunteers to the Home Guard, the numbers had swollen to one and a half million men. So if you can't oblige us with the brand gun, the Home Guard might as well go home. You are a new corps, a corps with its traditions to make. But you have already got your motto, and your motto is, kill the Bosch. It was while Ron Ashford was serving with the Home Guard that on the 31st of August 1940, he believes he witnessed a German invasion attempt on East Anglia. 
But before we examine that, we need to know a little more about Hitler's invasion plans. This is the site that Hitler wanted to see, the White Cliffs of Dover approaching. Annoyingly for him, he didn't have a top-of-the-range ferry with additional buffet bar and a range of attractive hostesses. What he had was far less seaworthy. In fact, with weather like today, he would have pretty much sunk the fleet. That was because Hitler was about to conduct a seaborne invasion, codenamed Operation Sea Lion, without any proper landing craft. He had to resort to commandeering almost every available canal barge in Western Europe and adapt them as best he could. One of the ports where these barges were being prepared for use was Ostend in Belgium. It was there I met Dr. Peter Schenk, an expert on the German invasion plans. So we're here in Ostend, and this would have been one of the points where the German fleets, the German armadas would have congregated. I mean, what would this have looked like 65 years ago? Yeah, this uh, big harbour would have been full with uh, 15 big transport vessels, and the smaller harbour would have been massed with barges, about 100 or so, with tugs and motorboats to push the barges. So it would have been fairly busy? Yeah, it would have been. And this would have been about the same in all the other? The other yes, ones? of course, yeah. In all, the Germans had assembled enough transportation in the channel ports to carry two enormous armies. They planned to get 138,000 men to England in two days. Most were to go to the south coast, but they were going to cause a diversion by sending another force along the east coast. Hundreds of barges were claimed in order to transport material, uh, ammunition, weapons uh, and horses uh, to England. These uh, barges were assembled in the canals beyond the Belgian coast and uh, adapted in shipyards for the crossing of, uh, of the channel. Ostend was very different in 1940. Hitler's victorious troops were keeping up their training, ready to cross the channel and deal a death blow to Britain. The plan was that the mass of the German troops uh, were to be landed with invasion barges and transports over the channel. And a minor part of this force uh, was to be dropped by parachutes. So it was a kind of a two-pronged attack. That's right, yeah. If an invasion were to take place, the first thing Britain would be up against would be a force of German paratroopers, determined to stop British reinforcements reaching the invasion beaches. It was one of the main tasks of the Home Guard to keep a careful lookout for German paratroopers. And so it was in Suffolk on the night of 31st August 1940. We in the local defence volunteers, our instructions were that night the watch for paratroopers. It was the most vital thing that we had to watch for and to try and uh, destroy the paratroop landing. There'd been many rumours of paratroops landing in 1940, but the relevant government documents have never been made available to the public. Now, there is a Home Office file which could give us some answers. It's called, quite intriguingly, Enemy Parachutes and Parachute Troops Reports on the Dropping and Landing of Hostile Agents. Now, it was supposed to remain closed until 2021, but we've managed to convince the Public Records Office, with a little help from the Freedom of Information Act, to open it early, especially for us. The contents, however, proved disappointing reading to conspiracy theorists. All the reports turn out to have been false alarms. Or were they? There were substantiated reports of the Germans dropping parachutes near Glasgow, Manchester and Birmingham in mid-August 1940. But the parachutes were unmanned. It was just an attempt to spread alarm and despondency among the British population. The Germans even broadcast phony news bulletins that could be picked up on British radios, announcing that German parachutists were mingling with the population of those cities. This was a very unsporting thing to do, well below the gentlemanly standards of warfare we British maintained. It was the sort of dirty trick we would never stoop to, except, perhaps, for one government department. Now it was here, at Fitzmaurice Place, Barclay Square, just down the road from the old MI6 headquarters, that the political warfare executive was based. Now so secretive was this outfit that even the government didn't refer to it by its real name. It was referred to as the Political Intelligence Department, or PID, 
and it was responsible for all propaganda, whether black, white, or a bit of both, like a penguin or a nun. Not a word. Their job was to cause the German to overestimate the capabilities of, of the British Army and the British forces, and there is no doubt that uh, they succeeded. It was important for morale that the British population believed we were better equipped than we were, and it was imperative that Hitler was kept guessing about our readiness. When the German high command was planning the invasion, Julius Caesar's book of 55 BC was consulted, because, albeit in Latin and with virtually no photos, it was the last written account of a successful invasion of Britain. Through carefully spread rumours, Hitler's guesses were made to include strange and fearsome new weapons. There be monsters here. Westminster House here in Dean Stanley Street was the headquarters for the Petroleum Warfare Department. Now, contrary to the impression given by fuel rationing and by teary-eyed grandmas, Britain had loads of extra fuel, and it was the job of the Petroleum Warfare Department to come up with new and exciting ways of throwing it at the enemy. Has anyone got a match? One of the Petroleum Warfare Department's tricks was to arrange a system of pipes and sprays that covered a potential landing beach with enough fire to ensure an incredibly warm welcome for any invading army. And if they got past that, there was another fiery feature waiting for them inland. The evidence of one still exists on the main road into Walmer, just north of Dover. This huge concrete block reinforces this wall, and all along it are these strange little pipes all thanks to the work of the Petroleum Warfare Department. It was a wall of death armed by a drum of fuel with an explosive charge at its base. As the enemy came past, the charge would be detonated, forcing the flaming fuel out through the pipe at incredibly high pressure. Result, roast German invaders. But the daddy of all the Petroleum Warfare Department's traps was setting the sea on fire. Was this what happened on the beaches of Shingle Street in Suffolk in 1940? Did invading Germans get a roasting? Or was it all lies, untrue black propaganda put about by the wizards in the political warfare executive? In terms of flame barrages, they weren't perfected until 1941. Five were constructed by then, but the one that would have been closest to Shingle Street was down in Kent. This is St Margaret's Bay, just north of Dover, and as the undersea phone cables would suggest, it's the bit of England that's closest to France. In fact, as far as my mobile network's concerned, I'm in France right now. This is one of the sites where the Petroleum Warfare Division designed and built one of its flame barrage defences. It works like this. This small green tub of water, that's the English Channel. And this here is St Margaret's Bay. And what would happen is they would lay pipes from the beach into the water, and then, if they saw an invasion coming, they'd pump petrol into it. So, we see the invading forces, and by the way, Sky One said we didn't need props for this, they were clearly wrong. Petrol would be pumped into the sea, like this. And then, before anyone knew what was going on, tracer bullets would fly out of nowhere and ignite the petrol. Don't let me be the to the German when our victory is ultimately won. It was just those nasty Nazis who persuaded them to fight, and their Beethoven and Bach are really far worse than their bite. The Germans over there in France were impressed, so impressed that they tried to fireproof one of their own barges and then float it through a huge fire they'd created. Apparently, everyone on board was killed. But the strangest thing about that is that their counter-experiment took place several days before the British experiments here on the south coast. Could this be the root of the stories of badly burned German bodies washing up on both sides of the English Channel? Or had there really been an invasion attempt? Stories of a failed German invasion attempt in Suffolk in 1940 just won't go away. Nearly all the stories describe badly burned German soldiers being washed ashore. Britain had experimented with a flame barrage to set the sea alight in the event of a German invasion. One of the experiments was witnessed by John Baker White, 
a black propaganda wizard from the political warfare executive. He got the idea of spreading the story through uh, the network of British diplomats, through leaflets, that the British were installing large-scale defences in the form of fixed flamethrowers along all invasion beaches, which would be ignited when the Germans invaded. So perhaps the conspiracy wasn't covering up a German invasion. Perhaps the conspiracy was convincing the Germans that they shouldn't invade at all. If so, the Germans weren't psychic when they conducted their counter-experiments. They may have been fed information on a weapon that, while spectacular, was impractical to deploy all along our coastline. It's certainly odd that with over 10,000 miles of coast at our disposal, supposedly top-secret experiments were being carried out right where German reconnaissance aircraft could see them. It's pretty clear that the Allies were pumping false information to the Germans at that early stage. Now, I believe that the Germans tried out sailing a barge full of German soldiers through a pool of burning oil to see what the effect was because they swallowed that story. So the Germans knew about flame barrage defence and, and they'd tried their own tests out, hadn't yeah. they? But the rumour yeah. was that when they tried that, it, yeah. it went wrong. There were some uh, trials uh, in, uh, made in Germany, but uh, they were uh, made uh, quite cautiously and uh, to my knowledge there were no victims uh, during these trials. So that's another rumour? Yeah. But why should there be one story about safe trials on the German side of the channel and a different story complete with burning bodies on the English side of the channel? You've got the military trying to make out they were stronger than they really were. You had the public absolutely in uproar over the thought of possible German attack. The military themselves also wanted to keep their activities secret. So by actually having sort of spurious tales going around, it actually helped keep the secrecy of what they were actually doing. But there were some pretty open secrets. Just as the Germans were aware of the British flame experiments, the Brits were aware of the build-up of the makeshift barges of the German invasion fleet. Did the British know about the German barges? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, the assembling of these barges was reported to the British by the Belgian resistance. And uh, the RAF bombed the waiting barges. Bombed so, uh, and, uh, and, and shot it on then and, and so and, here. And destroyed them? Uh, <laughs> no, no, not every time. Not every time, <laughs> okay. Hit and not, not always. If we couldn't completely knock out the invasion fleet, the next best thing was to make sure they'd be too scared to leave port. But how do you persuade an all but unstoppable army to give up and go home? You use rumour, you use propaganda. You convince the Germans that if they decide to attack, they'll get their fingers, and the rest of them, badly burnt. And you do it through conspiracy. Just across the Thames there stood the excitingly named Electra House, home of the Cable and Wireless Company. Now, a huge amount of the world's telegraphic communications were routed through the excitingly named Electra House, making it an ideal listening post and the base for the hidden voice of British black propaganda. Electra House was officially called the Department for Enemy Propaganda. Its activity was to approve and print leaflets that were to be dropped by the RAF, issue and control uh, stories through the BBC and to broadcast to the enemy. When we talk about propaganda, we're talking about things like this, dropped in their millions over places like Calais. It looks like a German military travel voucher, but it's a ticket to England. One way, no return. There were many leaflet drops by the political warfare executive, some of them designed to get the local population involved in frightening the German troops. This leaflet offers useful defeatist phrases in German, French and Dutch, including a rather tasteless phrase on how well the captain burns. Yet another reference to the sea being set on fire for German invaders. But leaflets weren't the only way Electra House had of scaring Europe. 
This is Bush House in London's Aldwych, home of the BBC's overseas services. And it was from here that the black propaganda of the political warfare department was broadcast all over Europe, but especially in Germany. Starting in September 1940 and speaking in German, chatty little talks were broadcast to the Nazi troops by a journalist named Sefton Delmer. He gave useful hints and tips for their journey to England and provided them with translations of helpful phrases they might need. Now, just repeat after me. Das Boot sinkt. The boat is sinking. The boat is sinking. Das Wasser ist kalt. The water is cold. Sehr kalt. Very cold. Now I will give you a verb that should be very useful. Again, please repeat after me. Ich brenne. I am burning. Du brennst. You are burning. These broadcasts hinting at burning seas may have made the Germans jumpy, but it was, of course, impossible to prevent their content returning to Britain as rumour. By the end of August, the British were getting very twitchy about an imminent invasion. The first significant invasion alert was on the afternoon of August 31st. The Admiralty were informed that a convoy of German shipping was moving up the Dutch coast, and it was thought that it might be invasion barges which could be off the Norfolk coast by the following morning. If the Germans had have invaded, this is what they would have seen as they approached Shingle Street. Miles of flat, inviting coastland. What they didn't know is if they tried it on, the Brits would be ready. While there was no record of a flame barrage at the evacuated village of Shingle Street, there were many other formidable defences in place by the night of 31st August 1940. All across here was defences of one description or another. On the beach edge itself, you had scaffolding poles leaning out so that any landing craft trying to land on the beach would be pushed back into the water. Behind them, you had barbed wire entanglements. Then you had a minefield. So if you look across here, you can see this ridge of the dike running back. That side was minefields. You'd then come over the top of that and suddenly be confronted by more machine gun posts. This ditch, which is an anti-tank ditch, and also these anti-tank cubes. Now, the cubes had stopped them travelling up and down the length of the beach and confining them all the time under observation and fire coming from the top of that Martello Tower. And what are these, these two little holes? And they're gun embrasures. There was a heavy machine gun in it, and it would have been continuous. It wouldn't be just firing a burst of fire. They could leave their finger on the trigger and it'll just go bup, 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 as long as there's bullets in the belt. So it'd just be mowing people mowing down? Mowing people down, yeah. Is that what happened at Shingle Street? What happened at Shingle Street? To be perfectly honest, nobody really knows. It could have been, as some people suppose, a full-blown uh, German invasion attempt that went wrong, or a raid, or a tentative attempt. Not so much a full-blown uh, invasion in itself. But Ron Ashford insists that the enemy wasn't only shot to blazes. He says they faced the fire at Shingle Street on that August night in 1940. As the landing craft came in, the sea was set on fire, we saw the glow in the first hour that the main strength of the uh, land and attempt had been destroyed. And those that got ashore put up a fight for about nine hours. From about, from around about nine o'clock, those that got ashore till about six o'clock in the morning, we heard the gunfire and the explosions, and after that everything died down. They surrendered and they were eventually taken to the prison camps in Northern Ireland. And one the reason I know that is because I got a friend who was in Northern Ireland and one of the prisoners there mentioned about the, uh, that he was on this uh, uh, invasion at uh, Shingle Street that night. And an officer got to hear the conversation and he immediately uh, stopped it. He said, this is a secrecy not to be told. And he, he warned this German that he's not to mention it anymore. Was the glow in the sky the result of a firefight at Shingle Street? Or could there have been another cause? Tangham Forest is very close to Shingle Street. In the the diaries of the 165th Infantry Brigade, their war diaries, they report that there was a large fire at Tangham Forest and they had to rush every available man to it. 
But according to Ron Ashford, that evening every available soldier was at a dance in nearby Aldborough. And an officer came up on the stage and he, uh, there was troops stationed in the area that, that were at the dance. The dance was stopped and some military personnel came in asking, uh, to rec asking all military personnel to report to their barracks and requisitioning all the cars because the Germans had landed at Shingle Street. Had the Germans landed at Shingle Street or was the forest on fire? I also went so far as to research through ARP documents and there was no recorded bombing or fire in Tangham Forest that evening. So why did the Liverpool Scottish and two other regiments call every man out to deal with a fire that didn't exist, if you get what I mean? So perhaps there had been an invasion, or at least a false alarm. But where do the stories of huge casualties come from? Something else happened that day which may provide an answer. A convoy of fierce-looking German barges was spotted moving along the Dutch coast. It caused an invasion scare. So, a flotilla of British destroyers were sent to investigate. Unfortunately, they ran into an uncharted minefield. It ended, however, in tragedy, with nearly 400 British casualties. Survivors of that disaster were landed at uh, East Coast ports like Great Yarmouth and Hull, and that may have given rise to some of the stories about convoys of ambulances and mysterious bodies being taken inland in conditions of great secrecy. They weren't dead Germans, it was actually Royal Naval personnel who'd been casualties in a, a rather horrific own goal. That might partly explain an invasion panic on the 31st of August, but on that day, Cromwell, the British code word for invasion imminent, wasn't issued. Seven days later, however, amid great confusion, it was. The most famous invasion myth or alert is that on the 7th of September 1940, the Cromwell Alert, where a code word was sent out which was misinterpreted by many of the local commanders as being that an invasion was actually in progress rather than simply being imminent. And it's significant that it's after that date that we then start to have stories about bodies being washed ashore and a failed German invasion attempt. But eyewitnesses on the continent insist the bodies were the result of failed burning sea trials. The Germans undertook exercises in the north of France where they made also fire on the, on the water, just, just like, like uh, in England. And here in Ostend, a nurse who worked for the Belgian Red Cross have uh, seen many uh, Germans who were badly burned. And uh, this information is uh, confirmed by two other nurses who uh, worked the, at the same time. That was in the autumn of uh, forty. There were many Germans who were uh, very, very bad uh, burned. Were the Germans burned in France? The Public Records Office contains one file that sheds light on the burning sea rumours. In it, a document describes intelligence gathered from a French naval officer who says that in September 1940, the Germans were carrying out a disembarkation exercise off Brittany when they came under fire from a British destroyer. One of the destroyer's shells hit a fuel storage tank that sprayed the troops with burning oil. A large number of soldiers were badly burned. From whatever cause, burned German bodies were washed up on both sides of the channel. Around about mid-September time of 1940, a number of bodies of German soldiers were washed up on the south, south coast of England. Uh, this led fuel to the, the claims that there had actually been an invasion attempt that had gone wrong. These uh, dead bodies uh, obviously came from uh, invasion exercises on the French or Belgian coast, not from uh, invasion attempts. No matter where the bodies actually came from, the world's press decided it was a good story, and they were sticking to it. By the early autumn, the story starts to get wound up in the story of setting the sea on fire, so that the bodies that are washed up are not simply dead, but they've also been burned as well. 
And before you could say flamethrower, there were stories circulating in Paris of trainloads of burned Germans, of corpses floating ashore, uh, burned beyond recognition. And by the end of 1940, American newspapers are printing that anything up to 80,000 German soldiers have died during one or two unsuccessful invasion attempts on the UK. So it was an example of a highly successful SIB, which is the word for a rumour, that was spread by all the means available. But this is not the explanation that Ron Ashford believes is behind Shingle Street. So why do you feel there's still a cover-up? Because, I would say, because of these traitorous families that were prepared to sign the peace agreement uh, are still uh, prominent. So uh, it's to protect uh, them. Protect them, I would, still say. Don't know. I would say that is the main reason. But there may be much... Do but there may be much darker and deeply illegal reasons why there's nothing in the files on Shingle Street. Dichlorid... Dichlorid... Di Mustard gas. Very little known fact is that we stockpiled poison gas around the coastal areas, ready to use in, uh, in the face of an invasion. We really didn't have much in the way of weapons to fight the Germans had they invaded and landed. So as well as concocting the story of flame defences, it was decided that we would, in the last resort, spray the invasion beaches and the invading troops with mustard gas. There would be very little evidence left uh, if, if it were the case, th that would be eradicated. It seems unlikely that the British could have illegally used gas against a massed German invasion without a single eyewitness from either side coming forward in over 60 years. Certainly, the Germans don't think it happened. All the German records uh, are um, telling that uh, the preparations uh, 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 were not uh, executed and there was no actual landing or landing attempt. We've combed the Public Records Office for anything that would shed light on the Shingle Street story and come up with nothing. But in doing so, we have unearthed one file that deals with German preparations for invasion in Norfolk, the next county to the north. Who would have thought that East Anglia would have been the focal point for Hitler's advances? Now, we've uncovered a story about hidden German airfields in Norfolk. When I told the people at Sky One about this, they got quite excited. They said, this is important. Danny, do this properly. Hire the finest aerial reconnaissance equipment the budget can stand. This is a Tergamer, built in the 40s. Hope it lasts the day. That'd be nice. Germans would have invaded a bit like this, except there will be lots of them. The, uh, the secret documents about preparations in Norfolk for a German airborne invasion and tell me what to look out for. Easily recognisable features in barns. These barns are supposed to indicate where the fields were all joined up uh, to make secret aerodromes. Just trying to see if I can spot any of their potential landing strips. Looking out for a red barn. Barns painted red. Is that a red barn down there? Or would it have been red 65 years ago? According to the secret documents, all the barns and the farms belong to the same company. Sites consist of farms operated by East Anglia Real Property. Just there. Some kind of red barn. It's grey as well though. Just there, over there to the left, a giant red barn. But not with a red roof though. Large area with hedges removed. Fields here, pretty flat and wide, like fields. Another red barn, they're all pointing east-west. All have aspect of specially prepared landing grounds. Could this also have been a potential Nazi landing strip, or is it just a field? Latitude 52 degrees, 38 minutes north, 0 degrees, 45 minutes east. Suitable land and take off heavy aircraft, all directions. Whoa! A little bit too tight there. Following sites have also had hedges removed and new barns built alongside. 
Another red bird, just down there. Another grey roof it's got though, and a huge field around it again. Seemingly in the middle of nowhere. Quite innocuous looking, like a barn. Owners in occupation understood to be aliens. Innocuous red barn or Nazi shed? You decide. Consider immediate investigation of site and neighbouring population essential. And investigate I will. After the break, hopefully. Could the Germans have landed at secret airfields in Norfolk? I'm about to find out. If all had gone to plan, the Germans would have been landing like this. In the middle of a big field with some big red burns in it. Oh. That's the way. Oh. The Germans would have liked to have seen things, but they didn't. Our boys in the RAF did. I say boys, they're all about 110 now. Those then young RAF pilots didn't pick up on the significance of the red barns, but they did spot something else very odd. Lines of lime hills. One of the pilots was Peter Meston. I took him up in a helicopter so he could show me how he saw the mysterious lime hills that gave the first clues. So, what did you discover and when? Well, the story really starts with a, a New Zealander um, by the name of David Watts, who I came into the flight office saying, would I check if there was anything odd about the countryside? So we went off, we looked around, and I couldn't see anything wrong with the countryside until he said, look at the lime hills. And then it came into focus. And here were lines of lime hills um, at intervals, quarter, half a mile apart. Right. But when you saw them end on, they formed a line. So when you looked at them from the air, yeah. they, they were kind of quite clearly positioned. Uh, oh yes, right up into the Midlands with arrows on it. And that's all we saw. Quite obviously to be seen from the air. And uh, we came down and talked it over. So we went down to the group captain and uh, made it very clear that if he didn't ring air ministry, we would. And I think he got the message and did so. And then uh, next day, all sorts of folk came down. And uh, we were interviewed and uh, re-interviewed. Finally told on no account we were to say anything to anyone, uh, which we duly did or didn't. Um, and we had absolutely no idea what it was we really discovered. Absolutely nothing. You've had some time to think about it. What do you think it is now? Well, I think it was the ground markings for the uh, airborne invasion of the UK. MI5 descended on Norfolk and the local population were cross-questioned as to who was responsible for the giant mounds of white lime. And then the giant red-roofed barns and the huge fields were discovered. I've just got to... I was going to say, this is what we're talking about here. This is one of the red barns. This one down here? Yeah. We had no information about these red barns at all. I didn't find out about those until well after the war. But the local people had thought the then red barns very odd from the moment they were erected. So, Brian, there are a few red barns like this around here, aren't there? Yes, there is. That all started with the company called East Anglian Real Property. And, and through that, the barns were built mainly from what I was told by the older people when I first started, to store corn. If they were painted bright red, they could act as a marker, and big enough for that. What I'm trying to work out is if this was a landing field, um, just where would it be? Because if, if you're talking about an airborne invasion, you're talking about a lot of aircraft coming in dropping their crews and taking off again immediately. They wouldn't hang about. Um, but there's plenty of room. So who actually built these? The actual steel work was done by Germans. By the Germans? Yeah, by the Instantly Germans. I'm suspicious. <laughs> yeah. But they done the steel work. The British done the brickwork. Uh -huh. And the Dutch done the woodwork. So a little of everything? Yeah, that's right. And how long before the war? Uh, the, the Cantley one's the only one with a date plate on, and that actually says Robert Anthony Dunn Anglesey, 1937. And they were bright red, you say? Uh, the roof was always red. The roof was? Yeah. 
Were the strange red barns markers for German transport aircraft? Were the surrounding fields big enough to land them? You see, the Ju-52 was a, a slow landing aircraft with big donut wheels, so it could land on comparatively soft ground. You see, that um, big plowed field yeah. probably would be big enough to land Ju-52s on and get them off again. And what happened to the fields? What they done is took, took all the banks out and the hedges mm. and made bigger fields by taking all, all the little separate banks out and everything, which caused a big uproar. Why do you think, um, why do you, think you were told to keep quiet about that? Why was it so important that, that you didn't tell anyone? Well, the quick answer is I don't know. What about uh, the slightly slower answer? It's still no. <laughs> um, you've got two separate things. You can either come up with the whole thing being based on the Dutchman doing it all, or the alternate is that there was a much, uh, much more local organisation um, that did it. I don't know. So a Dutch company buys yeah. up a load of land, yeah. sets up a load of red barns that are all exactly the same, yeah. flattens out all the fields, yeah. fills in the ditches, yeah. knocks down the banks and the walls. Yeah. What happens next? Mr. Nan Angsley was actually locked up because they suspected we, uh, the barns or whatever as being a help to uh, the Germans. So they said this guy might be helping the Nazis? Well, they could have. They, yeah, I think barns. that's what they said, yeah. And especially with the fields being flat as well, because I suppose that all, that all add up to that side. But whether it was right or not, you know, was uh, another thing. Why do you think we still don't know what they were for? I mean, surely the, story, the story's got out. We've seen the red barns. Why do we still not know? Sorry, Tom. <laughs> no answer. <laughs> um, obviously, there's some reason for covering up, but I don't know it. So there is a cover-up? Well, I presume there is. Uh, but, um, but we don't know who's behind it? No. And we don't know why? No. We just know we're not supposed to know? Uh, that's all I can say, yes. And the entire German airfield story is here, in black and white, thanks to a photocopier at the Public Records Office. File Air 2 slash 4557, for those of you taking notes. But there's not a single sheet of paper in that building there which deals with the supposed German invasion. Our invasion story started in Shingle Street. There is the possibility that the Shingle Street incident was not a German invasion, but a raid. Just south of Shingle Street was Bordsey Manor radar station. Its giant radar towers were proving a decisive factor in the German losses in the Battle of Britain. It certainly would have been a Category A target for a commando raid by the Germans, but there's no evidence that they ever came. Had they done that in any kind of numbers, I think the evidence would be there. Somebody would have come forward from either side and said, well, I was involved in this spectacular action in 1940. Nobody has. It's not mentioned in any war diaries or anywhere at all. So although it's a very likely-looking target, I think it's pure coincidence that Bordsey is so very close to Shingle Street. It is not a feasible place in which to make a landing, except as a raid. But as far as I can establish, there are no records of any such raid on Bordsey. I did not find any records about any clandestine operations uh, on, uh, uh, on British soil. Could it not have been a top secret invasion? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Could it not have been a cover-up since? Uh, no. At the end of my quest, I found the horse's mouth on Shingle Street, or at least the daughter of the horse's mouth. And your dad worked here, didn't he? Yes, my father was here in 39-40 in the RAF. He, he was a radar operator. And what did he think about the rumours of what happened at Shingle Street? 
Well, he talked very little about his wartime experiences in, with radar. I mean, because of the secrecy issue, it never, it never really went away for him. But Shingle Street, he was always very vocal. And if people mentioned Shingle Street, his view was that nothing happened at Shingle Street. And if it had, they would have known here at Bordsey. So that was his instant, quite strong that reaction. Was, yes, yes. And that's not something drilled into him, you no. know, by the powers that be saying you can't talk about this? No, no, obviously that's not. That's not propaganda? No. That's not brainwashing? No, I don't think so. It just didn't it happen. Just, it just didn't happen, and it was just actually, I think, irritated him. Did anything happen at Shingle Street? Did Ron Ashford mistake a forest fire for a firefight? Were there markers for an airborne German invasion of Norfolk? Has the truth, once again, been the first casualty of war, leaving behind it a gigantic cover-up? Thank you.